So this is a session, uh, something I've been playing with for a little while, uh, to say the very least. And it's another mapping tool, basically, but it's mapping and analysis, so it enables us to look at a situation and figure out what's going on, and, um, and then also look at the possible places we can intervene and make changes. So there's three main parts of this session. I'm going to talk about functional flows, so it's about uh, how do things move through your system, energy and resources, and um, the functionality of those the things that are happening along the way. And I'll relate that to a lot of uh, familiar things that we might see on a permaculture site. But it's, so it's basically going down below the level of what we normally see and trying to understand the kind of the engine underneath the vehicle, if that makes sense. We'll relate those to the different forms in nature, spirals and cellular structures and so on. Um, and then we'll finish off by basically looking at how that relates to creating resilient designs. Okay. So, so the first question, and apparently a philosophical question that rages a little bit, is this idea of do we live in a world of objects or of processes? And uh, so I've chosen a picture from one of my favourite films. Anyone know this film? Probably not. It's quite an indie film. It's called Primer. Any idea what the film's about? Two blokes. <laughs> two blokes are in it. Yeah, these are the two main blokes in the film. Um, but essentially you can't tell the whole picture. In fact, it's difficult to even show the content of a whole movie in two minutes of film time, isn't it? With the trailers, they're trying to communicate to you what's going on. Uh, but it, essentially, we need to... The difference between a world of objects and processes is how much time we spend observing. So if we just glance at things on the way by, we just see a snapshot in time of those things. You can't tell what's going on in this film just by looking at that. You need to see a whole series of things. You need to sit down and take time. And that's the need for protracted observation. So, so there's a quote from a, a lovely book that Steph, uh, Steph and Gaia sent me recently and said, you really want to read this book? And I agree with him, and I highly recommend it. It's called Seeing Nature. And uh, one of the, th the quotes that <coughs> fell out for me when I was reading it was this one. Um, I sit, and as my mind quietly explores the view, a rigid world of objects merges into a flowing world of change. Oops. And of course, if we only see things for a snapshot in time, we, we don't have a sense of really what we're looking at. So this is a fairly unfamiliar thing. Some of you may know what this is. Any ideas? It's called a thorn bug, and it looks like a thorn. It basically, part of its camouflage is to be on branches and look like it belongs to the the thing itself. So how can we know any, anything about this? So we need, again, we need to study it for a period of time. Uh, interestingly, these, these are the eggs and these are the adult. But until we studied it, we have no idea about what it does and how it interacts, where its relationships are within the world. So coming back to this idea of processes, processes are fed by flows of energy and resources. I am a, an ongoing process. I have metabolism. I do things. And I'm fed by multiple flows, air and water and nutrients and so on. Um, but the thing that drives everything is this idea of the climate, the climatic flows that are driven by planetary movement and so on. So we experience the seasons and day and night and, and uh, the different heating of the planets at different places creates wind and that drives movement of water and rain and so on. All of these things vary. Uh, I doubt that anyone lives in a climate where it rains exactly the same all the time, unless you come from Bergen, as I understand it, on the west coast of Norway. So, so how does nature deal with that? Well, nature builds resilience by seeking out new flows. So when one flow diminishes, either you're stuck where you are, if you're a tree, you basically go dormant. What a bear might do, uh, well, yes, they hibernate. Or you might be storing some stocks or you might just go and find some other flow somewhere else. So birds migrate to go and find another source of food. And, uh, and this might look familiar. So permaculture takes on board those principles and says, OK, how do we connect things together? And how do we look at um, designing our environment as a system, from a systemic perspective? So if we think about what are these flows, there are some familiar words up there, perhaps. So we have. Climatic flows, things like wind and the sun and water flows and so on. These are all, you know, we talk about sectors, we talk about slope and how things flow on slope. Um, we have animals 
in the landscape. So desire lines, so badgers, deer, things that come into your garden, slugs perhaps. Um, and sectors, so you might have a wildlife sector in where the wildlife comes into your space. Uh, we talk about zoning, that's all about how people, um, particularly ourselves, move around on the site and make use of the space. Um, and we also look at things like leaks in the system, wherever the leaks, and that's things flowing, that flowing away. That might be a loss of water or soil or nutrients or perhaps people that might be part of your project. Where are they leaking to? And, uh, and then we talk about stocks as well. So nature creates stocks to accommodate these changes in flows. So where are the stocks? Well, climate stocks are microclimates. It's where the cold air accumulates temporarily at the bottom of the slope because it's coming in more quickly than it's leaving. And so that cold air creates a frost pocket because it pulls more heat out of the landscape in that place. Um, or hot, the heat of the sun accumulating in a rock. Again, so it's being stored, uh, creating those microclimates. Uh, flora and fauna, so it's basically plants and animals and so on. Um, that's how nature accumulates stocks of energy and resources. And water and soil and so on. We look at all of these things. So if we think, what is the spiral of erosion? Are people familiar with this idea, the spiral of erosion, where each time you go around, things get worse? Yeah. Um, what is this all about? What are these things? If we're cutting trees, what's happening? We're getting less trees. Yeah. So stock diminishing, stock diminishing, stock diminishing, stock diminishing. Um, this is to do with flow. <coughs> and so on and so forth. So it's, this is a flow and stock diagram, the same as, uh, same as this, strangely enough. Anyone know this? <laughs> the permaculture chicken? Yeah. So uh, this is also a stock and flow diagram. We don't tend to think of ourselves as stocks, but I, the reason that certain animals might want to eat me is that I'm full of nutrients and goodness and uh, good food. So, and so is the chicken for some things. might eat, like to eat that chicken because it's full of nutrients. And it has needs, these are flows that come into the chicken, and it has products and behaviours, so things that come out of the chicken. And we, why do we do this analysis? What's the point of this? Yeah, so to connect things together, that's what it's about, isn't it? So um, if we need to know what the chicken needs, we need to know where to put the chicken in relationship to the things that it needs. And also, what does it produce? How can we put it in relationship to th other things that need what the chicken produces? It's, uh, so this is just a short section of a flow that travels all over the place. Flows, flows keep on moving, and we just happen to be in a little part of that. But they come to me, and they pass on, and they go somewhere else. And in permaculture, what we try and do is to hang on to those flows and circulate them a bit. So if you've... Anyone read a systems thinking book? Perhaps Thinking in Systems? Yeah? Um, Donella Meadows, Thinking in Systems, very well, rec highly recommended. Um, but one of the simple tools that you see in these books is this idea of a stock and flow diagram. So that you have a particular thing that could be how much wood you've got in your woodshed, or how many chickens, or um, it could be how much, <laughs> how much uh, stuff you've got in your house, and things come in to that stock and things leave that stock, they pass through. And um, in this particular book, she provides clouds because those things come from somewhere and they go to somewhere. And in permaculture, we try and give a lot of attention to these things. Where is that thing that I'm using coming from? Right? And what happens to it when I finish with it? Okay? Because actually that is the same cloud as this. <laughs> it looks like a different thing, but it's all the same thing. So anything that goes through just comes back around again. This is a very simplified version of the truth, because if, I'm, if I've got a bath and I say I want to fill it with rainwater, the rain, well, a little bit of that rain falls into the bath, but most of it misses. So how do I get the, the water into the bath? Oops, there we go. So we think about in the general water, in the landscape, the watershed, how does the flow get into the stock? So we've got some precipitation here. So this, uh, over here, there's snow coming down. And so what's, what's a glacier in terms of flows and stocks? Stock. It's a stock, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's a very important stock because for the people that live down here, they want a, 
a slowly released food, uh, water supply. Yes, if you live on glacial meltwater, you're relying on that water, you get precipitation at certain times of year, and you need much of that to be held and not just to rush off because you want that released slowly. If it all just came straight down the mountain, those people probably couldn't live there. Would you call a skill a stock? Um, like a carpenter, he's got a skill. So is that a stock of knowledge? Yes, I would say so. We'll get to that shortly because I'll um, yes, look at different kinds of flows and stocks. Um, whereas this obviously moves mo much more quickly. So liquid rain that falls on the landscape travels through the landscape more quickly. Some of it percolates into the ground and some of it flows off on the surface. Um, if you're familiar with blanket bogs, anyone live near a blanket bog, like the Pennines and so on? They're effectively another kind of glacier. They're designed to hold large amounts of rainfall and release it slowly. And if you degrade those landscapes, that water comes down very quickly and it causes all kinds of problems down here with flooding because the flow off is too fast. So the rain should fill the, the stock of water in the blanket bog and then release that slowly. So um, if we're looking at what's going on here, so there's a stock here, there's flows, yeah. But the, this doesn't get straight into here. There's a process, there are a bunch of other elements in between that intervene and focus it, collect it and focus it and so on. Oops. So we have our flow, this could be our rainwater, and we collect it with something. It could be literally a physical landscape, it could be the roof of your house. It's then focused towards the storage. So for this lake, this accumulates water because the landscape is directing the water towards that lake and it's accumulating there faster than it's outflowing. We often have some kind of process, so this might just be percolation through the soil is cleaning water. Um, that's something we might do with a, if we're collecting water off a roof, off a roof, through a guttering system, maybe you have a, a filter to clean that water before it goes into your water butt, or it could be a lake. Um, and then in human systems we have controls, so that's the tap that either you turn off and on, or sometimes it's a slow release in order to uh, modify this flow here. So this is more of an even flow than this one coming in. This is very variable, uh, and we're wanting this perhaps to be more regular. Not so much, but more spread out over time. And we'll also need some kind of very often a distribution system, so that might be the pipework into your garden, or it might be the river and the uh, river delta and so on, spreading out that water so that life can make use of that. And these different elements can be used in different places. They don't necessarily always go in this order, but it's quite a common situation. So if we were to consider, yes, house and garden, um, we have the pumping station for the water company, delivers water through a pipe and we have a tap on that so we can turn on the tap. It's uh, important to remember that they also have a tap and whilst it might seem quite common to just go and turn on the tap and the water comes out and we take that for granted, um, actually they could turn a tap, if they turn their tap off then our tap is completely irrelevant. And so this is, appears to be a reliable system but it's not very resilient because ultimately if they turn it off because we don't pay our bills or they don't have enough water to go around or the, they go bust or something or the pipe bursts, <laughs> then where is our resilience? We've got the other water supply we have at the moment is rainfall, which is irregular. So, so we do what they do. They've, the reason they have a regular supply here is that they have a stock, but it's right over here somewhere and it's way away from where we live usually and it's out of our control, we have no management over that and it's shared very widely. So to create some extra resilience, we build in a stock into our system, which might be as simple as a water butt within our garden. But we don't always have the space for the water capacity that we need to collect water off the roof. So we might then go down a level and say, where else can we store water? Where is the water needed? Well, in our garden, certainly the water is mostly needed by plants and the associated soil life that lives in relationship to them. So what we can do is look at the soil and say, can the soil hold more water? Can we increase the soil holding capacity? And that's usually by adding more organic matter. Okay, so, and if you increase the soil holding capacity, then you don't need as much water in backup because the soil doesn't dry out so much. Okay, so it's working at a different scale. 
Instead of working at the whole garden, you're working down at the level of the soil. So, where are the functional flow elements in here? So we have, what's this? That's the collector, yes. And where's the focusing? Gutter. The guttering, yeah. Um, what about any processing going on there? It's been moved. Yeah, you've got the filter. There's a water filter, yeah. So the water filter, this is a kind of uh, one of those filters that basically takes off the first water, which is usually dirty, and then you empty that out and drain it. So then the clean water goes in here. And then the storage is over here, yes. And, and then you have a distribution system here as well that then takes it elsewhere. And if we were to look at this idea of storage, so you have different words that we hear about in um, systems thinking. So the store is the place that you keep it in. So in this case, it's the water tank or it's the larder in your house. Um, and the capacity of that store is how big it is, how much can you fit in there. And then you have what's called the stock. So the stock is how much you have at any one time. So the stock is how much water there is in here or how much food you have in your larder. Okay? And that varies. That goes up and down. And if it's not easily visible, if you've just got a, a big tank and you can't see into it, then it's, you don't really know where that stock is until it runs out or it overflows. Uh, your larder, perhaps, you have more direct um, relationship with because you go in there and you look around. <laughs> what can I eat today? <laughs> uh, right, we're on to oh, more of that because we've got nothing else left. Um, and then there is this idea of a buffer. So the buffer is how much you need to get through a period of shortage. Okay, so how long, how much time um, do you experience where it's not raining? So you might say six weeks worth of water to water the garden um, because we could possibly expect that it won't rain for six weeks. That might be not on Dartmoor. <laughs> but in certain parts of East England, there may even be months where you don't have any rain. So you need to work out how much water you need to get you through that period, and you need the capacity of your store to be able to meet that. If the capacity of your storage is less than the buffer, then at some point you're going to run out. And that's where resilience is a problem, because that's usually when everybody else runs out as well. So if we look at these different parts of this thing, they all have different properties. So a flow has direction. It's going a particular way um, in three dimensions, of course. It has speed or velocity. Um, there's a certain quantity of that flow. And we, we're talking about not just the things that are carrying the flows, like the wind and the water, um, but also the things that they carry, like nutrients um, or uh, element, uh, detritus. So wind might blow leaves into your garden, and there's some nutrients coming with that. Uh, so there's quantity, there's quality. So water in particular might be particularly clean or it might be quite contaminated. But it also we might be looking at um, the apples coming off your tree and, and so on and so forth. And then there's variability. So these things, um, particularly the speed and quality, might vary over time depending on uh, different things that are going on in the landscape. So those flows. Uh, then collectors, collectors, so if you think roof, landscape and so on. These have a location, they're somewhere in three dimensions. Um, they have a certain surface area, which we can measure. If you do a rainwater calculation, you're measuring the surface, well, you're measuring the surface area from above that the rain falls onto. And it has some degree of efficiency. So if you're doing rainwater calculation, you're looking at what's called the runoff coefficient. So um, metal roofs are most efficient because they water runs off them quite readily, whereas things like thatched roofs and flat roofs and gr uh, green roofs with lots of soil hold a lot more water. They're designed to hold more water and slow it down. Um, or at least in, if you're trying to reduce flooding, then they're a particularly good thing to do. But you'll get more evaporation and you'll get less collection. Um, and landscapes are the same. So the different kinds of soil you have. If you live in the South Downs uh, with all the chalk, a lot of the water just goes straight into the ground and it won't run off the surface. And then we have uh, focuses and distributors. I've put them in together simply because they're the same thing in opposite directions. Uh, but they also have direction. They're focusing your flow in a particular direction. Um, they have a certain capacity. There's a point at which they might overflow. Um, so 
a river system um, has moments when it overflows its banks and that's part of nature's way of moving nutrients and distributing um, but there's capacity there there's efficiency again in the system because if you're moving something from one place to another there's leakiness there you can lose some of those things and the electricity grid is particularly iffy in this department because the further you move electricity um, at a given voltage the more you lose of it and I think something like 40% of all the power generated is lost before it even gets to our homes um, and there's also a delay in the system so things go in at one end and it takes time for them to come out the other end and sometimes those things are invisible um, but there's certainly a slowing down um, of there's a delay in noticing that effect over here because of this um, thing in between and we might look at that as, as some kind of friction as well that's slowing down um, and also worth saying that things like collectors and focusers also change or the, have the potential to change the properties of the flows so they can change their direction, they can change their speed, they can lose some of them, they can change the quality of that, those things as well. So storages, that's your larder or your water tank or whatever, they have location, again they are somewhere and we have to again think 3D because if you're wanting to collect rainwater your collector needs to be above your water tank but if you bring it too far down, then you lose the potential to then uh, use the difference in height between your water tank and, for instance, your garden. They have capacity, that's how much you can put in them. Um, they can fill and empty at a particular rate, so that might cause losses, overflows in your gutters and so on. Um, they can be leaky. Um, and they also, um, different things, uh, have different abilities to kind of look after the things inside them. So and that can be to do with shape as well but if we think about seeds um, different seeds keep for different times that's usually to do with size but also um, a wooden water butt might um, have a different effect on a, a plastic water butt it, the water inside for instance Oops. and then the things inside the stocks themselves have quantity there's so we can measure those things um, they have quality that's also measurable, um, but they also have a rate of degradation, so that could be the apples you put in your store degrade at a particular rate, or the water that you have in your water butt gets mosquitoes, larvae in it at, at a certain rate and so on. Um, and we can, again, play with these things. And then processes are these things that just go in between to match things up. So if we've got two things that don't connect together because of a particular reason, we might have to put a process in between that might be a simply a, a matter of cleaning, so it might be a cleaning process, it might be a cooling process, for instance. Um, processes can change the properties of flows, um, quality and so on and so forth, or completely transform them. If you're cooking, if you're baking a cake, you're doing a process, you're turning those uh, one, one particular energy form material into another. Um, it might also be about increasing the longevity of stocks um, or making them easier to store. So in the body, um, the body turns uh, the sugars that we eat, uh, the liver turns them into glycogen, and we have fat stores. Fat stores are more concentrated, but they take longer to re-metabolize to produce energy. Um, but, and you know, bees will collect nectar and pollen and so on, and they'll make honey in order to increase the longevity of that stock for themselves. So, um, yes, so the metabolism as well and then the controls which we can think of like taps and plugs and so on uh, they manage the levels in the stock of the stock um, either by slowing down or completely stopping and allowing periodic flows but they can also be leaky so we might lose you, know, you might have a dripping tap and so on so an example of how we start looking at this. So the collector is the roof, it's placed in three dimensions, it has a given surface area we can work out, we can look at the runoff coefficient of the roof, the different materials. So for a, a tin roof like this one, it's about 85% of that water that falls onto the roof, you'll be able to collect that. Uh, we have some storages, so there are two storages here, one is for 
The cold water is immediately collected off the tank. This is a solar hot water system, by the way. Um, and its placement is quite close to the roof because if we have that on the ground level, then we can't take advantage of a drop between here and the next elements. Okay. So that's high up. That's the cold water, which just literally fills into this hot tank here. Um, and the hot tank is only ever emptied when we turn on the control to let the water out. That's the tap. So there's a, an insulated hot tank here. Both of these are storages. They both have location and relative location. They both have a capacity um, and so on and so forth. And degree of preservation in this case is to do with heat in this one. Um, because so you're insulating it to try and keep that heat in. And the heat comes from the collector, which is down here, that also has location. It's down below, physically below this, because we want to make use of the thermosiphon effect. So that's, um, we're working with the laws of physics all of the time. And uh, so as something warms up, it has more energy, it becomes less dense, and that less dense material rises, whether we're talking about air or water. So your warm water starts to rise in the panel, and we want it to go into the tank, so we have to put the tank above so it can rise into the tank, and it replaces the cold water, and so the cold water is relatively more dense. So at the cold water in the bottom of this tank then comes back down into the panel because that, that wants to fall, it's more dense, and you get this circulation. As long as the pipes are big enough, about 22 mil, you'll get a thermosiphon effect, and you won't need a pump. And that's all because we've thought about where we put these things in relation to each other. Okay. So we've got control. Any other elements in here? Functional elements? Yes, so um, there's <coughs> this pipe system here. So there's another tank here at the same height. So these basically work together. So you can fill that one up um, when you're getting a lot of rain. But then you can also empty this one across back to here. And then the main water source is over here, uh, stacked behind the building. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little exercise to do. Um, I'd like you to work in twos or threes. I think I've probably got enough for there. So if you want to... Okay, so how was that? What kind of systems were you thinking of? Complex systems. Complex systems. Any specific ones? Bodies. Bodies? Okay, that's interesting, yeah. We were looking at water for a tree. Water for a tree. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Composting, excellent. Any other? Nice. There's a bit of a theme there. Uh, so also electricity generation. Mm. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So, so how do we use this in design? Let's whiz three of this. Um, well, we start with what are our human needs. Ultimately, we need to know. What is it that we need? That's what we're designing for. And permaculture originally was very much about meeting our physical needs of um, food and water and hopefully clean air and certain light and so on. But how do we meet those needs that are perhaps less reliable than just being able to breathe in fresh air and so on uh, for energy and such like? Um, so here we have permaculture human inputs and outputs. And we need to um, make sure we don't confuse a strategy for a need. This is a particularly th interesting. It's the same as not confusing a function with an element. So I want to go play tennis. I don't play tennis, but just as an example, <laughs> I feel I need to play tennis. Um, I don't need to play tennis, but I might have a need for exercise. I might have a need for fresh air and connecting with somebody else, um, the adrenaline of movement and so on. So the tennis is the strategy. The need is the exercise and so on. So when we're talking about elements, we tend to be actually, we talk about elements, but actually we're trying to look for ways of meeting particular needs, meeting functions. Um, and we have this kind of Maslow's hierarchy, which was evolved into Aldefer's existence, relatedness, growth triangle. And, uh, and we've always, to begin with, focused on this existence. How do we meet our needs for food and water? And these are very much energy nutrient flows that are moving through the landscape that life basically captures. Um, I have various nets in my body, so this is a particularly good one. It's very well evolved to pick fruit, <laughs> uh, which is one way my body harvests nutrients. 
and then puts it down the tube, and then it goes into this squiggly thing uh, with lots of crenellation, which is uh, a good way of absorbing, but there's lots of bacteria in there. That's the cellular pattern and so on. That's all part of the collection, focusing, and so on. Um, but also we've got flows at other levels as well. And, um, and so the eight forms of currency and capital, people familiar with this? Ethan Rowland? Um, I was looking at this last night and thinking, where does electricity fit? Is that an entirely different thing? Because I wouldn't really call it carbon, nitrogen, water. I mean, you might say a tree and a stock of wood in your log shed might be considered to be, well, dead, live, formerly living capital. <laughs> Is it material? But then electricity is energy flow, isn't it? It's a difference. So anyway, let's not get lost in that. But there may be more than this. <laughs> and, uh, and again, this capital is a stock, currency is a flow. So we tend to, we've always focused to begin with on this idea of kind of the living systems. But it's, you know, there are many flows that come through our landscape. So some of the questions we might ask, and I'll whiz through this, so don't need to write these down because I will be sharing this. But what kind of flows are entering your system? How are they circulating around? Maybe you might be thinking about uh, could they circulate better? And what, what flows are leaving? Um, and we're thinking about climatic flows like wind and rain and sun, but also biological flows, so animals and insects, you know, pollinators flow through the landscape and we might want to direct them. Um, Techno-industrial is the stuff that we make you know, um, plastics and oil and all of those kind of things that um, we make or we process in order to change it from its natural form. And then what quantity, quality, velocity, direction and variability, that's all the properties, of course, that these things have. And, uh, and variability and our need determines how much storage we need. So basically, uh, how often do we run out is the question. And then we can look at the catchments and how efficient are they. This is Tamera and this lake that uh, Sepp Holzer was involved in organising. Uh, the lake, which used to look like that and now looks like that, uh, was filled entirely with rainwater. And he just looked at the landscape and said, that's the catchment. All this water is flowing down here. And if we put something in the way, we can keep a stock of that water and hold it. And that's how these lakes were created. And are the catchments connected to the stocks? We once did a, a water audit on a PDC, and we identified that the roof was um, the roof and the the storage containers, the water butts and so on, were perfectly matched, apart from the fact that they weren't connected. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a very nice roof, and round roofs, very nice, but quite difficult to put a gutter on, and. Um, and this roof as well is quite low efficiency in terms of runoff anyway, because a lot of this water will soak into the soil, the plants will re-evaporate that water. Um, and then over here we've got multiple stocks. In fact, the uh, land matters where this is taken, there are many, many more tanks now than there used to be, because they realised over time that they needed to increase the capacity of that storage. But by having multiple tanks, they reduce the risk of any losses. I came across a project in um, Malta when I was teaching there, and because one of his colleagues, one of the people he knew, had lost half their water overnight, 60,000 litres of water. So they have to store six months of water for the summer. He lost 60,000 litres of water because the, uh, one of the people that had come to help had left the, the irrigation taps on overnight. So Pepe, in his system, he had a solar pump that pumped one cubic metre to the highest point on the land. And if the, pipe, if the tap was left on, if the control was left open, then they could only lose at most one cubic metre of water. Okay, so multiplying your stores gives you redundancy. So processes, so here's a sand filter for cleaning water before it goes into a tank, or a grey water um, cooling tank, if you like. So the grey water comes out hot at the, the kitchen sink, goes through a little basic filter, um, which has a lot of edge, that's a net, <laughs> obviously. And, uh, and then you've got the cellular pattern, that's to do with cooling, taking the heat out of the water, and then as the next flush comes through, it replaces. This is then nicely cooled. That can go into the garden. So, and that's a process that allows you to connect your grey water from your kitchen sink um, through a filter into your garden and make use of it. But you have to cool it down. So in order to identify, if we're going to the root of resilience, it's one of the key vulnerabilities that we have. And for most of us, it's 
food because so many people live in this kind of situation with all this potential and no food growing and then they go to Tesco's and Tesco's is in charge of a lot of food and a lot of preservation but their stock is a very long way away from most of us okay and we don't have access to that so it's much more resilient to look at that and say what, is, what does our design need to focus on how how much of those things can we bring more into our local environment and not everyone has a garden but we can put more energy into our community and maybe community growing and so on and so forth um, but identifying our key vulnerabilities helps us to identify what's the most important thing that we need to be looking at in our system so for me the challenge with Go Sadim is that in order to identify goals, we need to know where we are. We need to know what we need, what's our key vulnerabilities, which comes back to looking at the landscape. Where are we? What do we not have? And um, in order to then come back to setting some goals, and I think often we go, into, we go in with goals because we've already done some surveying. We say, I want to do this thing, but I've lived here for six years, so I already know the place. I've already done the surveying. So in a sense, there's a kind of a goals goals comes from an initial survey that then allows us to go back out and do some more surveying. To some degree it's been human's approach to the landscape for a long time. It's like I want to do this and I don't give a shit what's here, I'm just going to do it anyway. And then we go out, it it's kind of epitomises maybe kind of a, I don't know, that uh, we're in control and we'll conquer nature. Mm -hmm. As opposed to going out and saying what is it that the land can do. Is that being yeah. promoted as a kind of design tool? Well, it's, it's a tool that's a tool to play with. Mm, I don't feel very yes, with that. that's all right. It's it's there's nothing wrong with having a goal. I just yeah, say that you have to do some circle, you have to do some surveying before you can identify what your goals are, essentially. Yeah. Um, so when we're looking at flows, uh, what we what we're trying to do is direct those flows. So this is a nice bit of uh, thermal mass in a building. So kind of <laughs> found this on the internet. But what's nice about it is that it's, um, you want to direct the flow in, so we're wanting to capture a certain amount of sun. This has got a nice overhang, so you don't get too much in the summer and more in the winter months. Um, and we're storing it in our thermal mass, so here's our flow, here's our store of heat. But we also remember that stores have, stores release their flow as well, and we want that flow to go where we want it, which is into the house. We don't want the heat that we've stored in here to just go into the earth. So there's an insulator here to make sure that the outflow goes back where we want it. Does that make sense? So we're having a store. If your storage is emptying in the wrong direction, then actually, rather than just increase your store, you can say, let's direct that outflow where we want it. And that's a different way of approaching it. So you might not need more stone or concrete, you might just need to insulate it in the right place in order to allow that heat to flow in the right direction. You kind of change the laws of physics. <laughs> so, Bill Mollison on a very short little video on YouTube, which is uh, the secret of a good designer or something. And he says, your job as a designer is to maximize the storages. If you're good at that, then you're a good designer. So I would, the only word I would question is maximise, because if you over-engineer things, you're putting in a lot of material into things that perhaps um, then require more maintenance, and you don't actually need all of that. You don't need to dig a massive dam in your garden. But we do need to think about the size of our stocks. And I love this particular little uh, thing here. It's, um, I was having a conversation with Jo Barker the other day, and she was talking about the in, uh, architecture students she worked with and that she was teaching them solar passive design and they were still wanting to orientate them away from the sun because they were saying, the sun makes the buildings too hot. <laughs> but what? <laughs> in Britain, it's like complaining that, don't give me a pint of beer, I've only got a shot glass. <laughs> you need a bigger glass, you don't need less beer. Well, you know, we don't know. <laughs> so, a greenhouse is another lovely example. Greenhouses get very hot in the day when the sun comes out and cold at night because they don't have on the whole enough thermal mass. We need some more stock. We need to increase our st storage of that flow. We don't need to reduce the flow. So you need a bigger glass, you need a bigger thermal mass. Um, it's looking at the wrong way around. It's basically saying, hey, don't give me all that money because I can't spend it today. <laughs> so. so just a... Uh, 
a tiny little reframing of things into principles. So uh, what principles are these? Collecting beneficial flows into stocks? What are we doing there? What principle is that? Catch and store energy, absolutely, yes. What about protecting against damaging flows like the wind and so on? Yeah, it could be to observe and interact. It's also to do with microclimates and things, creating microclimates. Uh, find best placements for elements, putting things in the right place. Relative location, Relative location. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well done. Collect, uh, connecting elements together into systems. What's that all about? Putting things together. Integrate rather than segregate, create beneficial relationships, yes. Um, working at multiple holon levels. So that's so a holon is a different scale. See, I've given it away now, haven't I? <laughs> different scale. So my garden is one holon, and I'm a smaller holon within my garden system, or a smaller holon within this system here. Um, and my come from? It's a systems thinking term. Yeah, Danella Meadows uses it a lot. And essentially, holons live inside other holons. So they're things that are whole in themselves, like my heart is a holon because it's a collection of heart cells working together in training to pump together. Um, and it can be seen as an entity in itself, but it's part of a bigger entity, in the same way that I'm part of a bigger entity uh, at many different levels. So it's just looking at different levels at which we can interact. And we could say working on the self, working on the house and garden is the next one out, and then there's my locality, that might be transition, then there's a bioregion, then we've got national and so on, and they're all different scales at which we can work at. And then creating redundancy. This one is about having multiple things, yeah. multiple elements for each important yeah, function. Yeah, yeah. So you have multiple tanks or multiple storages of food or whatever it is, and uh, connect into multiple flows if you can. So you're not highly reliant on one thing that may, may disappear. So, there is a book, <laughs> and that's the screenshot of the book. As you can see, it's some way away. So I'm just saying sometime in 2018. Um, so how you might use this, uh, we were sat in here yesterday. I'll just be another minute or two. And uh, talking about the diploma system and the people that were leaving the diploma system. So hopefully there's none of you. <laughs> but the people that were leaving the diploma system and just kind of dropping out, and how do we address that problem? We were discussing about you know, how people come into the diploma. So we've got um, people do PDCs and then they kind of get focused in. So the PDC is a collector of diploma apprentices or future apprentices focused in by uh, literature and so on. Um, people may be doing a session on the diploma on the PDC. So they're focused in. There's a filter there. So reasons why people may or may not do it. So it might be to do with the cost. People might go, it's too expensive. Or actually, it's really cheap and I, I really want to do it the perceived benefits of doing that drives people through to the first control, which is you've got to pay and fill in your form and register. And then you go into the system. And then this, the system is the stock of apprentices. That's all of us, or all of you, um, because I'm over here now, <laughs> uh, doing, the apprent doing the diploma and at different stages. And, uh, and then at some point, you come out the other end. Hopefully, um, you accredit. So that's the assessment that says, yes, off you go and um, you become a member of the College of Diplomats, um, and some of whom are tutors. And so all of us sat in the room yesterday were in this little group here. But along the way, not everyone goes there. Some of us, some leak out of the system. And so, and the problem is the observation. So in a sense, there's a kind of a box here, and there's little portholes that we can see into which are the points at which we have tutorials or come to convergences and we start to you know, have conversations and how are you doing and so on. But the points at which people get lost are the places in between where we can't see that going on. So, and obviously there's a point where other things are more important than this and so there's a leakage. <coughs> and we're over here just trying to understand people that do this, but none of us have done that. So it's kind of difficult. <laughs> so then we're saying, actually, we can't make that decision. We need to talk to people that are doing this. Yeah, we need to understand the what's, what is it. Indeed. How and how we can support. And that any one of you is a potential person that might do that, rather than do that, except for Peter, who's finished, and great, <laughs> and so on. So, um, so it's just... <laughs> so this really is just a, 
a way of mapping the system, but then to start to look at that and say, okay, this is what's going on. What are the different elements within the system? Where is the focus and the filters and the distribution and so on? And how can we change the properties of some of those things to help? So in a sense, what we want to do here is keep this flow moving through here um, so it can come out the other side. But that's just one example of using the tool. Well, it's to do with this kind of keeping the flow moving, yeah, isn't it? They, they will be seeing that bit that the yes. external Indeed, it's yes. A, but not everybody's in that support population. No. There might be one point of entry into that, looking at those flows. Yes, which is why, as tutors, we, we can't be the only people trying to keep that flow moving because we only have certain interactions, mm. whereas you have many more interactions perhaps with each other. and mm -hmm. so. Guilds, absolutely. Yeah. So we've run out of time, obviously. Um, I pretty much kept to the hour, I think, given the time I had. But um, I'd like to offer, if there's enough interest, to do to come back here after l dinner this evening. And we'll have, we've got the whiteboard and we can start to play with some other ideas, how this applies in other situations. So you could bring your design ideas and things maybe you're stuck with and we could maybe map them out and... So it would be much more interactive. So roughly, just give a rough idea who might be interested in that, just to see if it's worth setting that up. OK, so I'll, I'll book the room out, and um, we'll be here at 7.30. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>